moments, what I'm trying to get across to you, what Weber's trying to suggest is that bureaucracy actually is an effective, can be an effective form of rule in relationship to some of its predecessors. Of course it could be that the Taliban might be a more effective form of rule, that patrimonial rule in Afghanistan may be better than this mishmash of patrimonial and bureaucracy. But of course the claim of this newspaper and the many Western reporters, of course, is that the Taliban is a form of patrimonial rule in which violence rules. In fact, this article, let me finish, this article ends. Whoa. He says... In Quarabag, one of the largest districts, the Taliban used 40 villages as basis to dominate hundreds of other villages, said Quarabag's deputy police chief, Captain Mohammed Yunus. Police recruits are easy prey. 24 policemen have been killed in Taliban ambushes and roadside bombings in Quarabag over the past year, Captain Yunus says. We don't have any presence with the civilians. Taliban live with them 24 hours a day. Residents take... Comp- so this, this, this immersion of the patrimonial order within the community. They have a judge and a prosecutor. The Taliban is active at the bazaar in each village. In Waghaz district near Quarabag, there are just 50 permanent Taliban members among a population of up to 60,000 ethnic Pashtuns and 33,000 Hazara, said the sub Yet the Taliban do not need a large presence to dominate, he explained. Last year he said the Taliban took three men from their homes whom they suspected of helping the government. They burned the three men and chopped their limbs off with axes, he said. That's why 60,000 cannot beat the 50. So it sort of reminds one of the organized crime represented in the Godfather. Patrimonial order, as you always insisted, is is an order that is ruled by violence. So you have on the one side a patrimonial order, on the other side this attempt to build up a bureaucratic order. Yes, Juliana. What is suspect to me is um, the idea that somehow this ideal type will negate this culture of corruption because, and that will, you know, because even within the United States, judges take bribes and they have, they might just feel a sense of calling, they might just have tenure for life, but you still see that. And so then, and, and as we're talking about the dysfunctions of bureaucracy happen as well, so seeing kind of a hold in dysfunctions in the ideal type calls into question, you know, this project. Of right, a, a right. So, what, so what is missing from Weber's analysis is the Weberian approach, namely to perhaps, perhaps say, what are the cultural prerequisites for this ideal type? Mm-hmm. That perhaps we do need some sort of Protestant ethic or something. Some, perhaps, perhaps one might argue from a Weberian standpoint. And in fact, you're right, of course, this happens. I mean, it was a great case not so long ago. If I get this straight, there was the yeah, amazing case in Pennsylvania, I think it was. Yes, basically, judges, very good. Here were judges were taking bribes from a detention center. I think it worked like this. Right, here's a detention centre for juveniles, and here's the law courts, a good bureaucracy, and basically the judge was actually receiving money through some enterprise, as I recall, this is dollars, called kickbacks, so the judges over here were receiving kickbacks for every juvenile they sentenced to the detention court. And lo and behold, there was suddenly an increase in the number of people who were being charged. So, yes, detention. So essentially, these judges, and it's all come out in the open now, and everybody has admitted their guilt, and there were two judges, actually, who were accepting money from the detention centre and were making their judgments in accordance with the maximisation of p- p- profit, right? And were making incredibly harsh sentences. In fact, that was just the example I was going to read to you about, but let me just open, you might be interested in the, in the opening passage. Was a, this is from sometime about the middle of February. It says, at worst, Hillary Transu, this is the opening of this, the article, is headline, judges guilty in scheme to jail youths for profit. At worst, Hillary Transu thought, and she was a student, she might get a stern lecture when she appeared before a judge for building a spoof MySpace page mocking the assistant principal at her high school in Wilkes-Barre, Pennsylvania. She just put something on her website. A spoof. Uh, just like you do all the time. I'm sure there are lots of spoofs on your website about people like myself. And this is what will happen to you if you're in Pennsylvania. She was a stellar student who had never been in trouble, and the page stated clearly at the bottom that it was just a joke. Just a joke. Instead, the judge sentenced her to three months at a juvenile detention center on a charge of harassment. Ha, ha, ha. Beware. Yes. No, but Giuliani, you're right. Of course, this sort of violation of the bureaucratic order does happen in this society too, perhaps to a lesser extent than in other societies. But yes, we are always vulnerable. So that's why Weber is insistent on having this vertical accountability to one's superior, to rules, so that, and to a fixed jurisdiction. That's why he insists upon the importance of his ideal type. Whether it's, whether it's actually always realizable is another matter. Yes, Matthew? Um, I guess building off of that, one thing I'm noticing is that the distinction between bureaucracy and patrimonialism is also opposing um, rationality and emotionality, so it's assuming that um, through rationality you get rid of emotionality. 
And I feel like that's a very flawed assumption, and especially if you take a look at social psychological research, it would show that that's not Right, well, we'll come to that in a second. Indeed, Weber is assuming what he calls a dehumanization, and that we become cogs. Well, yes, uh, but he's trying to align, he's trying to align the interests of the, indiv- of the bureaucrats so that they are vertical, so everybody is looking up to their superior, and that they have tenure for life in the organization. There are structural ways to organize the bureaucracy to avoid this sort of situation. And to some extent, of course, bureaucracies do approximate to Weber's ideal type, in spite of the dysfunctions that they also goes along with them. Yes, okay, Aaron, number two. Well, if we're going to apply Weber to this example of Afghanistan, and then point out, well, oh, the, the, the ideal bureaucracy has these dysfunctions in it, I, I don't think, I think that's kind of missing the point, as one of the final examples, because Weber would argue that, yeah, this has dysfunctions, as he once in a while knows, but it's the best we have. It's the best we have. So he would say, yes, put the bureaucracy there, but the problem is, and maybe it's our presence there is creating an instant. <laughs> Very good. Good. Yeah, this, is a, this is great for an honesty. It's a great study of Weberian understanding what's going on in Weber. Yes, indeed. What is, the, what is the truth? Simple to say, oh, well, there's a culture of corruption. That is a non-sociological explanation. <laughs> Anybody can say that. It's unprovable. It's a ridiculous idea. No, well, we, are soci- excuse me. we are sociologists, right? So we must look at the specific context. So indeed, it may be that, in fact, the very presence of the U.S. is actually creating conditions in which it is impossible for the Afghan government to develop the necessary bureaucratic autonomy. Very good. That is worth empirically examining. Indeed, indeed. Very good, very good, very good, very good. Oh, I've got three questions and now I'm moving on. Right, Josephine. Um, the Taliban is very much in, how do I say, they control a certain government. And it's not getting for the U.S. And so I'm wondering if we can liken that to um, the idea of the Lord and the serf. Yeah, I think it's much better to link it to what? To the Godfather, to Don Corleone. And the fact he doesn't want to get into narcotics, whereas well, Bazzini, or oh, was it, was it Bazzini? Who's getting into narcotics? <laughs> Saluzo, but he was a, he's talking for, anyway, Teratelli or whatever their name was. But yes, no, I, yes, you could look at it in terms of Lord and Serpent, and also you could look at it in terms of precisely, this is a sort of organized crime, the Taliban, using narcotics, as in fact mafia groups have organized ma- narcotics here in Italy. Yes, that's the idea, and that's what, of course, that was the story in The Godfather, that was the possibility that a bureaucracy will remain, replace in patrimonial order. Yes, Rosa. Which people? The ones down here or the ones down here? Yeah, well, the bureaucracy is serving these people, but of course it's not really serving their substantive interests. Yeah. So what's the interest of these people? Well, what do you think? Korea. Point number six. Or five. Yes, Korea, that's the idea, in a, in, a, in a Weberian bureaucracy. Yeah, 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 yeah. Tenure for life, that's... And establishing some sort of esteem. These bureaucrats are really established as a higher status group than the people down who are the ruled. Yes. Okay, all right, very good, very good. I'm going to move on. I knew that I shouldn't have got into that. No, I had to. I, 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 I you know, it's... it's it's easy to be critical of the very ideal type that Weber sets up, but I think there are many projects in the world that actually conform to this attempt, so we should know what this is about and what it's, perhaps some of its dysfunctions are. Very good, very good, very good, very good. And the struggle between patrimonialism and bureaucracy is an ongoing struggle um, in many places in the world, many, many places, not least in this country. Yes, all right, I want to just get on to point number two. That was my summary. It only took uh, <laughs> three quarters of an hour. Now, what we have to... Let's go back up here. Okay. <laughs> Hmm. Ah. I want to elaborate a little bit more because there's a beautiful section in this chapter called The Permanence of the Bureaucracy The Permanence It's unshatterable and there's some amazing passages in this section on pages pages 228 to 230 228 to 230 and in the interest of time I'm going to read only a few what Weber says on pages 228 to 230 is very simply first sentence of section 10 reads error number 2 reads once page 228 section 10 once it is fully established it is unshatterable Oh, no, no, that's enough. That's perfect. That's perfect. Then, uh, you want to, if you're so keen on reading, third paragraph, last paragraph on the page. Read it with, with emotion, with that irrational sentiment that you have. <laughs> the individual bureaucrat cannot squirm out of the apparatus in which he Cannot squirm out of. Mm-hmm, go on. In contrast to the horrific or avocational notable, the professional bureaucrat is... Chained! ...to his activity, <coughs> entire material and ideal existence. 
Pingo Cog! That's right. That's it, Franks. Bureaucracy is an iron cage. Bureaucrats cannot squirm out of this apparatus. They are a cog in a machine. And then on page 229, 229, he says in the second new paragraph, the discipline of officialdom refers to the attitude set of the official for precise obedience within his habitual activity in public as well as in private. That's why you should look at uh, Futurama and uh, Hermes requisitioned his groove back. Yes, it's all about habitual activity that spreads into all arenas of life. The discipline increasingly becomes the basis of all order, however great the practical importance of administration on the basis of the filed documents may be. And then we will skip the part on Bakuninism, because nobody takes that seriously. And two, four, five lines down after that, he goes, every reorganization of beaten or dissolved troops, as well as the restoration of administrative orders destroyed by revolt, panic, or other catastrophes, is realized by appealing to the trained orientation of obedient compliance to such orders. Any attempt to destroy, any attempt to sweep aside the bureaucracy is doomed to failure because the bureaucracy Bureaucrats are so fixated, so habituated to their activity that they will recreate the bureaucracy in the face of any such onslaught. Such compliance has been conditioned into the officials on the one hand and on the other hand into the governed. If such an appeal is successful, it brings, as it were, the disturbed mechanism into gear again. So one might argue, following this, that, you know, in countries where bureaucracy is relatively new, the officials are not habituated to act like cogs in a machine and therefore perhaps are not able to sort of respond negatively to, uh, to opportunities for bribery. Though that, again, is a rather cultural argument, but that's okay, that's okay. Yes, okay, then, um, then we have the idea, the last paragraph, or the next to the last paragraph on the page, 229, where Weber talks about his, uh, begins the objective indispensability of the one existing apparatus with its peculiar impersonal character means that the mechanism, in contrast to feudal orders based upon personal piety, is easily made to work for anybody who knows how to gain control over it. A rationally ordered system of officials continue to function smoothly after the enemy has occupied the area. He merely needs to change the top officials. So there's the idea, you know, if you can just change the top officials then, if you can become a leader in of a bureaucracy chief, then you can wield that bureaucracy for your own end. It's like a machine that you possess if you are at the top, the chief at the top. So it is a bureaucracy is a machine controlled from above. And then, haha, the coup de grace on page 230, 246, seven lines from the top. Seven lines from the top. Simeon, why don't you read this? Such a machine. Such a machine makes revolution Revolution is technically more and more impossible. Uh-huh. Especially when the apparatus controls the modern means of communication, telegraph, etc., and also by virtue of its internal rationalized structure. Yep. Go on. In classic fashion, France has demonstrated how this process has substituted coups d'etat for revolutions. All successful transformations in France uh, have been come out of very good. You know, France, the rebellious French, you know, the contentious French, the, the one, the one characteristic of the French is that they are always rebellious. They're always staging revolutions, but the revolutions turn out to be coup d'etat. That is to say, they don't transform the social structure, but they replace one group of leaders with a new group of leaders. But the structure is saying to say, bureaucracy is all powerful, it cannot be destroyed, revolution is impossible. And Marxism is a, <laughs> is an impossible dream. Quote Neil. <laughs> yes. So this is an amazing section, number 10. Yeah, number 10. Or number, yes, number 10. In which Mar- Weber here is talking about bureaucracy's machine that binds the officials to their places like cogs, chains them to their activities, in which they are habituated to their place, conditioned to be bureaucrats, and once established, this machine keeps on going on, and any attempt at revolution is doomed to failure. In fact, it is worse than failure. Revolution will do what? Revolution will do what? Revolution will do, uh, attempt at revolution here will do what? Strengthen and enhance the bureaucracy. It will strengthen and enhance the bureaucracy and likely dissolve passive democracy so there are fewer and fewer constraints on bureaucracy. So revolution will lead to what? Dictatorship. And dictatorship of whom? Of the bureaucracy, of the official, dictatorship officials. So instead of getting socialism, the dictatorship of the proletariat, you'll get the dictatorship of officialdom. That is Weber's pessimism at its best. That he is saying to us, this is the best you can do. And if you follow your utopian imaginations, and he's talking to the socialists, of course, a part of the socialist movement all around him. 
that has had successes but mainly failures. He's saying that that socialist movement, and of course he's already seen in 1920, he will see the three years, that's when he dies in 1920, three years after the Russian Revolution, he's still saying, he's saying that attempt, socialist attempts at revolution, Lenin one might say, is deluded in thinking that you can smash bureaucracy. To attempt to do so will lead not to socialism.